question. It is I'm trying to go I'm trying to go up. I don't go back to the beginning here. Uh -oh. I thought I just by hitting the how do I get up? How do I get up back up? Um, I would hit escape and then just go back to your first slide. Hitting escape. And it's oh, you, you have a Mac, don't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I got to get back up. What do you think? Um, is there a command? I don't. Let me look at what the Mac. Oh, there you go. Is that going forward? No, that's going backward. That's going down. That's going forward. Yeah, I need to go back up. However, you did that. Do the opposite of that. Well, did Ben do that? Oh no, you did that. Okay, there we go. All right. All right. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, welcome back, everybody, to the uh, second session on um, climate and charismatic water birds. Our second speaker this morning is Sumner uh, Madison. And uh, Sumner's had a 40 year career as a W uh, Wisconsin DNR non game biologist and avian ecologist. And today he's going to talk to us about Wisconsin's trumpeter swan recovery program, a 30 year retrospective on research management and collaboration. And just a, uh, a reminder, if you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in that Q&A box and we will answer them at the end. So with that, uh, thanks a lot for coming, Sumner, and, and we look forward to your talk this morning. Well, thank you very much, Ben, appreciate it. <clears throat> Before I begin, I want to dedicate this talk to Rodney King. He was the pilot biologist who flew us into the swan nest where we collected the eggs in Alaska. And uh, Rod was a really unique and accomplished biologist, uh, pilot biologist. At the time, back in 1989, when we began our first collection, he was one of only five pilot biologists. I got to know him quite well over the years and um, very was very so, very sorry and sad to uh, to hear of his passing in 2018. So this talk is dedicated to him. This is a picture of uh, of him re refueling his Cessna 186 float plane on the upper left there, and then uh, to the right, uh, that's myself, much younger looking, and Randy Jurowitz and. Uh, and Rod. So I just wanted to talk about the history of this project to begin with. This is a map from a 1985 National Geographic magazine that shows the historic distribution of trumpeter swans in yellow. And you'll, you'll also note that in dark green, these were the areas where trumpeter swans were known to occur back then. In light green is the wintering, pre, the pre 20th century wintering range of trumpeter swans. So basically swans from our area would migrate down the Mississippi Valley down to the, uh, the Gulf Coast. And then over to the east, you had uh, another uh, wintering area. So you can see from this map, um, we had no trumpeter swans in Wisconsin at that time. And one of the reasons that trumpeter swans disappeared as a breeding bird in Wisconsin was that they were shot for their meat as well as for their feathers, which were used to adorn fashionable women's hats and East Coast shops and also in Europe. And their skins were ground into powder puffs. So that's a pile of uh, trumpeter swans that you see at the bottom of your screen there. 
And none other than John James Audubon preferred to use their quills for his fine detailed sketches. So we, we were without trumpeter swans as breeding birds by the end of the uh, 19th century. So this is a, uh, a quote from Father Jacques Marquette, 1673. The river on which we embarked is called Meskuskin. It is very wide, has a sandy bottom, various shoals that render its navigation very difficult. We safely entered the Mississippi on the 17th of June with a joy that I could not express. Its width is very unequal. Sometimes it's three quarters of a league, a mile. Sometimes it narrows to three arpents, acres. We gently followed its course, which runs toward the south and southeast, as far as the 42nd degree of latitude, which is northwestern Illinois. And I put in bold here, we saw only deer and cattle, which were bison at that time, and swans without wings, because they dropped their plumage in this country. And this could only be the trumpeter swan. We basically have three swan species in Wisconsin. The mute swan, which was introduced back in the 50s. So there were no mute swans back then. The only other swan it could have been is the tundra swan, but the tundra swan at that time of the year is way up in the Arctic nesting. So it had to be the trumpeter swan. And this would, this would correspond with, uh, with a malt, probably a malt of, of one of the adults. So back in 1673, this is some evidence of, squan, of swans, trumpeter swans appearing in Wisconsin. So we had a recovery goal of, of 20 breeding and migratory pairs by the year 2000. And uh, we were, you know, we were, we were hoping that this wasn't too ambitious at the time. <laughs> Before I go any further, I just want to say that, that here are some of the principal people that were involved in the restoration and recovery of Trumper Swans in Wisconsin. In the upper left, we have Pat Manthe, who was our kind of our field general, who helped coordinate a lot of the, the uh, interns and uh, a lot of the monitoring. Uh, in the center, upper center is Mike Mossman, who did a lot of the research on release sites to determine suitable release sites for trumpeters that we, we reintroduced, released into back into the wild. His wife, Lisa Hartman, on the right, helping to do the same. Lower left, Becky Abel, currently with the International Crane Found. Oh, actually, she's with the Wisconsin Wetlands Association now. Was with the just recently with uh, ICF. But uh, she was in charge of our decoy rearing program, which is something I will talk about in a minute. And then in the uh, lower center, Ed Diebold in the center there, myself to the left of him and Randy Jurowitz to the right. Ed was the curator of birds at the Milwaukee County Zoo. And Milwaukee County Zoo was the, uh, the place where we went with all of our eggs. And they are the ones that uh, were responsible for hatching out the eggs. And then two very important people were Mary and Terry Kohler. Terry recently passed away, he's no longer with us. Uh, they, uh, they, got a, they got a call from Governor Thompson at that time who heard that we were trying to get to Alaska. And uh, he asked Terry, would you be interested in going uh, in 1989? And Terry said, uh, count me in for all of the years. So they flew us and literally they were uh, a pilot team. Mary and Terry were co-pilots. They flew us in their Citation jet. I had never been in a, in a jet like that before, small jet. They flew us up to uh, Alaska each of those years, 1989 through 1997 to collect up to 50 trumpeter swan eggs. So they were uh, absolutely critical to our success. Well, this is a composite slide, rather busy slide 
showing you first the, in the upper left-hand corner, it's a cutout of, uh, of uh, the Minto Flats west of Fairbanks, which was, which was one of the principal areas we went to to collect eggs. And then 510 kilometers, about 316 miles to the southeast, the Nelchina Basin near Glen Allen. And these were the two areas that we went to to collect trumpeter swan eggs, as I mentioned, up to 50 eggs a year. That first year, 1989, I quickly discovered I had a serious air sickness condition in the first half hour of a 13 hour collection. And I was collecting not only for Wisconsin, but for Michigan. So I was collecting up to 50 eggs for Wisconsin and then another uh, 10 or so for Michigan. I learned later that it was a inner ear condition that I have, which was rem remedied with a scopolamine ear patch. So after that first year, things were fine, but that first year was absolutely brutal for me. I lost my breakfast in the first half hour and I somehow survived. At one point, Rod King turns to me in the, in, the, in the plane and he says, you're not gonna check out on me, are you? Because he saw how sick I was. And I had, I had to, uh, I became very dehydrated, had to end up wearing a winter stocking cap to keep myself warm. <laughs> Because uh, that's that's how I that's how I was uh, faring. I was I was really suffering. In any case, uh, the the picture next to that is a shot of the Melchina Basin, and basically the approach the pilot would take would he would he would uh, Rod would have these all of these nests, uh, whether it was in the Minto Flats or the Melchina Basin. He would go out before we arrived, a couple of weeks before, and he would write, he would mark on a topographical map the location of each of the swans, swan, uh, swan nests. So that when we arrived, he would simply fly out, check his map, and land at each of these lakes, uh, where we would then pilot up to, to the, uh, as close as we could to the nest, I would be wearing a vest. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, that's Randy Jorwitz handing me the egg collection box that we put all of the eggs into. But that vest, I was told, I'd be walking across a floating bog in some cases. If I fell through, I should pull a ripcord and that would keep me above the water. <laughs> so in addition to being quite air sick and being groggy, I had to be careful pretty careful in, in how I would approach the nest. And then when I, once I got to the nest, I would uh, look, look at the, uh, the contents and typically there would be anywhere from one to nine eggs. Uh, females that have laid eggs for a number of years typically have clutch sizes that are five to nine eggs. Uh, and typically the, the female uh, is incubating the eggs, but when she leaves, as she does normally every once in a while to bathe and preen, she covers up those eggs with a nest material. So when I arrived, I would uncover the eggs, count, count the eggs, as you can see in the upper part of the screen there to the right, and then number them, put a letter and number on each of the eggs, and that would then correspond to the location where we would be collecting. Um, I would uh, candle the eggs, as you can see in the right-hand corner, upper right. Now, I didn't have any experience of candling trumpeter swan eggs in the wild, and I had to practice at game farms here in Wisconsin that had trumpeters. And in that case, you're using an electric candler, but I'm using a handheld candler here. And basically what I'm looking for is a solid black mass up in the egg, which would be about three quarters, the egg would be, be about three quarters full of this black mass. If it was opaque or clear, the egg was either 
just recently laid where it was bad. And Joe Johnson, who came with us that first year, made a joke at a Trump or Swan conference that, uh, that one of the eggs that I collected for him was bad, but, and that I couldn't, I couldn't tell that because I, couldn't, I had no sense of smell because I was so sick. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, that was the procedure. I would candle these eggs. And um, uh, we were also under Fish and Wildlife Service restrictions to leave at least two eggs in a nest so that the, uh, the family would have at least a pair of cygnets to, to raise. So if it, was the, if it was the clutch of seven, I would take five eggs if they were all fertile, but they weren't, they weren't always, I, from my candling, they, didn't, they weren't always, always uh, fertile. So in any event, I'd leave two good eggs in a nest. On the lower, lower uh, part of that screen, you see Randy Jerwitz, uh, who was my boss at the time, with a specially designed portable incubator designed by one of Terry Kohler's companies called the Volrath Company. Until we had that, uh, that incubator, that mobile uh, incubator, we had used the black box you see in the left there that Randy's handing to me. That was, that was the box in which we would ship with us take with us uh, in flight back to Wisconsin. Now the hot water, the, uh, the eggs were kept warm by hot water bottles. And we had to time the arrival at airports on the way back with calls to, to the janitors to make sure that, the, that their, high, that their uh, hot water was at its zenith because we were keeping, we wanted to keep the, the uh, temperature inside that box between 93 and 97.5 degrees. So it was quite an interesting uh, arrangement, interesting procedure. But after that first year, Terry Kohler said, enough of this. Let's design a, let's design a mobile uh, 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 crate that uh, we have, you know, we'll, where we have digital thermometers, we can either cool off the eggs at a certain temperature or, or warm them back up. And uh, so we didn't have to rely on these hot water bottles. Uh, just one other story I wanted to tell. Um, before that, you can see in the lower right-hand corner the, the egg trays at the Milwaukee County Zoo into which the eggs were placed. And at the bottom, the bottom tray, you can see chicks that are just hatching out. So although we, we collected up to 50 eggs, each year, they weren't always all the same age. They were at different, different uh, stages of development. But the one story I wanted to tell you was that uh, 1990, Rod King was called away to do a fire, to work on a fire. And so uh, his substitute, Lee Hotchkiss, came up in a, a little bit larger plane. And Randy, who's quite a bit bigger than me, and Lee, who was about Randy's size, and myself went out to the first lake, and we had all kinds of trouble taking off from that lake. At which point, Lee Hotchkiss said, you know, this isn't gonna work. We're gonna have to, uh, we need a smaller plane. So he, uh, he radioed uh, a, a, a father-son team, uh, Jerry and Al Lee, to come out from Glen Allen. This is when we were collecting in the Nilchina Basin. We tried to alternate between collecting at the Minto Flats west of Fairbanks and Nilchina Basin uh, to the southeast. So while we were waiting for them to come out, Al said to me, he said, why don't you and I go out to this, this lake, this large lake that I know about, and in the center of this lake, there's an, there's an island. And in the center of that island, there's a big bog and there's a trumpeter swan nesting out there. Do you want to collect from there? And I, I said, sure, why not? So we went out there 
uh, we he beached the uh, the plane uh, at this island. He got out, took off his sunglasses, and said, "Well, I figure it'll be about an hour, so I'll just wait here for you." At which point he proceeded to sun himself, just waiting patiently. And I, I then took a small gray suitcase that I used for putting uh, the eggs in that I would collect. And I walked and I, before I, before I walked, uh, I actually asked him, I said, well, how do I know, you know, where this, you know, where this, uh, this bog is? And he was leaning against the plane and he said, looking up at the sun without turning to me, he said, well, you'll hear them. They'll hear them calling. And then he said, oh, by the way, be careful. There could be some critters in there. <laughs> by that, he meant, you know, possible bear, possible moose. So I began to, uh, to wonder whether this was a good decision that I'd made to, uh, to accompany him out to this lake. But I, I took off like a good soldier. And just as he said, I heard the swans calling. I was able to find the bog lake. But when I got there, I noticed that the nest was in the very center, open water, surrounded by sphagnum. And I realized the only way I could get out there was to swim out there. So I stripped down to my skivvies and then I had a Ziploc bag and I put that, I put the candler in there and a pencil and I had, had a, uh, uh, a pair of calipers along to measure the eggs. Put that in a Ziploc bag, put the Ziploc bag in my mouth and uh, kind of uh, uh, stepped and crawled my way into the water. As soon as I got in the water, it was freezing. I quickly swam as fast as I could and with the last bit of strength, I reached the nest, basically a moat, and uh, put my knees, you know, rested my knees on the edge of the nest and looked at the center of the nest, opened up the, uh, uh, opened up the, the material that was covering the eggs and saw that there were just three eggs, which means, and which meant, that I could only take one egg. At that point, I was praying that all three were viable, what I, what I would interpret as, as being fertile. And as I was looking at, as I was candling each of these eggs, the deer flies and horse flies were attacking me, attacking my legs relentlessly. But I, I had to just not pay any attention to that because I had to, uh, had to candle these eggs. So I candled them, one, two, and three, all were fertile. I took the largest one, put it in the Ziploc bag after I had uh, put the, written, written the, uh, the letter code and number for the egg and then realized I had to swim back to shore. Well, I didn't hesitate for very long. <laughs> and with the Ziploc bag in my mouth, I started swimming back and again, was just hit by the coldness of the water. Well, I got back to the edge and I realized there was no handhold. There was no way to, to get out except to literally crawl my way out of the sphagnum oh, up, up into the upland. And, uh, and I did that dragging all kinds of muskeg and sphagnum with me, when all of a sudden I heard something to my right. And I stood up, dripping wet, looked to my right, and what should I see but a bull moose staring at me. So I quickly thought, well, what will this moose do? And I remember hearing all kinds of tales about how moose would charge and attack people, uh, hoping this was not going to be the case. 
uh, the moose was chewing away, I stopped chewing, looked at me again, and then slowly ambled off to the right. And I could only figure that it must have looked at me and thought, what in the world is this strange looking creature doing, dragging all of this wet aquatic vegetation hanging off of him? I must have been quite a sight for that moose. My heart was racing, glad the moose was gone. I quickly put the, the egg in the gray carrying little gray suit, uh, suitcase and headed back to the plane after getting dressed. When I got back to the plane, Lee was in the exact same position, looking up at the sun, leaning against the plane. And he said to me, without turning to me, he said, well, I, I heard the, the birds back there. I figured you must have reached it, uh, reached the nest. Uh, how did it go? So I explained to him what happened, the whole story, at which point he leaned forward and said, darn, I wish I had my video camera for that. So that was the story. So we ended up uh, collecting 385 eggs between 1989 and 1997. You can see the locations where we alternated between Minto Flats and Nelchina. Now in the wild, 60, 60 to 80% of trumpeter swan eggs hatch. So we were very pleased that of these 385, 356 or 93% of them hatched out. So I think that really is a testament to the fact of, of some luck on my part and picking uh, viable eggs, but also to the uh, having having the uh, the colors fly us quickly back to uh, to Milwaukee and having the uh, the eggs attended to really supremely by the Milwaukee County Zoo staff, including uh, Ed Kim Kim Smith, who's uh, currently at the uh, International Crane Foundation and uh, the rest of the veterinary staff. So very, uh, very appreciative of all the work that they did. So what did we do once the eggs hatched out? We put them into two different programs. The first called decoy rearing. And this was the, really the brainchild of Stanley Temple, uh, Professor Emeritus Stanley Temple from Department of Wildlife Ecology at that time at University, University of Wisconsin-Madison, you, you can see here in the center. Uh, along with uh, Michael Mossman worked on this as well, uh, and Becky Abel. And basically the idea was when the eggs hatched out, the cygnets were transported to the upper left, left, left hand corner. You can see a corridor there, makeshift corridor, where uh, University, University of Wisconsin interns and Becky Abel would move this decoy, this swan decoy, along this corridor back and forth, and the cygnets, newly hatched cygnets, would follow the would follow the decoy, and and learn that uh, that the movement of this swan, they associated it with the time to to feed. We had uh, trays of mealworms uh, on the side there. And in this way, for the first three to five days, they learned to habituate to the presence of that decoy. And then, and then at three to five days, they were uh, days old, they were flown up to decoy rearing sites, uh, which had been selected by, by Mike Mossman. And the University of Wisconsin interns then interns and flow tubes would take the cygnets, which were kept overnight in cages, out onto the marsh. And they were led then to loafing sites and to feeding sites. And they stayed that way, I should say, they were that way, kept out there until they were allowed to fly free at the age of 15 or 16 weeks of age. And they then uh, flew on their own, migrated on their own. Now, typically when swans migrate, they're migrating as a family group. So there are parent birds guiding the cygnet south. In this case, the big question mark was, would these birds migrate? And that first year, 
you know, all of the geese and the ducks were bleeding and the swans were still there. Eventually they, they flew and they flew south to as far as 15 miles north of Dallas, Texas. And one of the reasons we went to Alaska to collect these eggs is that we knew, knew that they had proven migratory genetics so that they were genetically programmed to migrate and they just had to, uh, in this first year, just had to uh, reach that stage where they actually, they triggered their migration and they did migrate. So we were very relieved by that. The second program into which the eggs were placed was something we called captive rearing. And so near, near uh, uh, Milwaukee County Zoo, not too far away, in Pewaukee was the GE Medical Systems facility. And we worked with GE Medical Systems and they built a site just for the swans. And uh, they, we, here we, ra we raised them in captivity. Marine Gross, the lower left-hand corner was in charge of their rearing. And then at two years of age, we would wing clip them uh, and transport them to uh, selected release sites uh, in, at wetlands in northern and central Wisconsin. Uh, what's interesting about this site, this GE Medical System site, is that one of the original owners of the land there was Carol Neely. Now, Carol and Cy Neely was a couple that we stayed with up in Glen Allen. And it was a total coincidence that, <laughs> that, uh, that her, as we learned, that her family used to, to uh, have the land where this GE Medical Systems facility was built. So you talk about a coincidence of coincidences. It's, uh, it was really quite remarkable that the people that were caring for us up there actually used to own the land where, this, where the uh, captive rearing was occurring. So in the lower right-hand corner is, is the, one of the release sites. Uh, and th that first year we were looking at, uh, at Crex Meadows up in Burnett County, Northwestern Wisconsin. The third technique we used, which was less important than decoy rearing and captive rearing is something we called captive parent rearing. And in this case, uh, at the BP Amico plant near Naperville, we had, a, we got a pair of swans to them uh, and uh, they were able to raise cygnets. Um, these were birds that were on, these were adults that were unable to, to fly. And um, we had three different sites that uh, where we had captive parent rearing occur. But what would happen is that when, this, when the cygnets would uh, approach fledging age at 15 weeks, we would take them then and, and release the cygnets up at selected sites in, in Northern and Central Wisconsin. So as far as the criteria for the selection of release sites, we're looking at areas that had minimal or no waterfowl hunting really an abundant and diverse submerged and emergent uh, aquatic plant community. It was minimally used uh, by people had uh, presence of, of uh, emergent or shrubby escape cover, the absence of power lines, because that's very important. Um, we're finding now that uh, since, you know, since the program began is that power lines can be one of the, uh, the principal mortality factors, collisions with power lines is a real serious issue. Looking also at abundant diverse wetlands within 10 miles of the release site. And an additional uh, criterion was that uh, the uh, decoy rearing sites uh, had controlled access near a uh, DNR or Fish and Wildlife Service maintenance facility. Um, also, we're looking at water depth of one to three feet for working in the flow tubes. In the presence of islands or dikes appropriate for the overnight cages that, uh, that held the cygnets. So how did we do? 
with the uh, the release between uh, releases between eighty nine and two thousand five. We released 196 birds through the decoy rearing method, 159 through captive rearing, 32 through captive parent rearing, and then other miscellaneous uh, techniques, a total of 394. So about almost 50% of the birds came through the decoy rearing technique and about 40% uh, from captive rearing and only about 8% from the captive parent rearing. You can see in the lower left-hand corner, person in the flow tube, um, they would have a, a pole connected to, with a line connected to the decoy that they would pull along and the stignets would simply follow that decoy to a loafing site or to a feeding area. So once we uh, began to establish trump or swan nests, we then shifted into a monitoring phase and we had uh, aerial surveys to locate the nests, uh, ground truthing, uh, we get out there and determine the clutch size of, of uh, at nests. And then in an August flight to locate families and count signets, followed by a signet roundup, mostly signet, sometimes it would be a molting adult that we'd also round up. This, this would occur in August and September. Pilot would be overhead. We'd have a walkie-talkie directing a flotilla of kayaks and canoes. And then we'd mark the birds with Fish and Wildlife Service leg bands and neck collars. We conduct health sampling for lead poisoning and diseases and for DNA sexing. And then we'd also weigh each bird. We'd come back and in, in, uh, do one more flight in late September, early October to determine production, how many signets were actually fledging. So this is just a slide showing what the roundup was like in the kayak. You could see the uh, signet unable to fly, of course. Uh, and uh, once, unlike geese, which tend to be quite aggressive uh, once you have them in hand, once you have a, a swan in hand, they become very docile and relaxed, uh, relaxed in terms of what we would think of of being relaxed in the, in the sense that they do not squirm or fight at all. They just, they just allow you to process them. And here we are weighing them and then releasing them. In this case, this was at the Yellow River Cranberry Marsh. The last final roundup was in 2012. So we did roundups uh, all the way through the late 90s up to 2012. As you can see, it's quite a, quite a large crew that uh, we'd usually have to, to go out and, and uh, catch, the, uh, catch the signets. Uh, not always an easy chore because sometimes the signets would disappear into the emergent vegetation and the pilot, that's where the pilot overhead would be very important. We'd be able to tell us where the signet was, if it disappeared, and then we'd be able to go in and, and uh, capture it. So how did we do? As I mentioned before, our uh, objective was 20 breeding and migratory pairs by the year 2000. I, I can tell you that we were a little bit nervous in the late 90s, 97, 98, 99. We would, we would go between 18 to 17 to 18 nesting pairs wondering, well, will we get to the uh, to our 20, you know, our 20 pair goal. And uh, we were experiencing some losses due to lead poisoning, some losses due to collision, some vandalism as well, mainly to the south of Wisconsin. Uh, but in the year 2000, we climbed up to 44 and, and since 2000, the numbers have increased exponentially so that by the time we did our last count of all the nests in 2014, we were at about 253 nests. 
And this is a, uh, just a map that shows you the cluster, the concentration of these nests. Primarily, as you, as you can see, the large number, large percentage of that time were over in the uh, northwestern part of the state, Prex Meadows area, and also to the south in Polk County. So um, we learned that, uh, that Trumpers were basically selecting shallow uh, impoundments, waterfowl production areas, uh, sedge and cattail marshes that were one to two meters deep or less. Also marshes, small farm ponds, glacial potholes with abundant submergence and emergence. They also occupied backwater sloughs, beaver ponds, bogs, hardwood swamps, uh, lake marshes and lake edges, lake edge marshes. And uh, nests often were constructed on small islands or, or islets or built up mounds, sometimes muskrat lodges of detritus and with, you know, with cattail, wild rice or bulrush. Uh, I should also mention that um, back at the, uh, back in 1999 through 2001, we experimented with tracking uh, 16 swans with satellite trans transmitters involving the R Riverbanks Zoo, the Bronx Zoo, and the Milwaukee County Zoo, and others. And uh, based on what our results from that, uh, the shortest migration was 41 miles. Basically, this, these are birds from Crex going to, uh, to the Southwest, um, not that far. The longest migration was 607 miles down to Southwestern Illinois. And we found that from that small little study that wintering habitats generally were similar to breeding habitats. Um, for example, central Wisconsin with the dike pools and impoundments uh, we found that in the winter time they were they would work, they would uh, winter at these reclaimed strip mines in southwestern Illinois, uh, managed uh, principally for waterfowl. In the lower left, you could see the the map of uh, the line of, of that long migration. So fast forward to to today, we are part of a regional migration. Uh, migration ecology study, telemetry study, that started in 2019 and really is looking at uh, trying to evaluate year-round year swan movements, uh, determine year-round habitat use, uh, limiting factors, cal calculate annual survival rates. And so Mark Swans beginning in, in uh, 2019, uh, we now have uh, between 2019 and 2020, a total of 103 to date. Another seven are planned in Wisconsin, but you can see Iowa, the MB is, uh, stands for Min uh, Manitoba, Minnesota, Michigan, Ohio. Uh, all of us together are in this project. And if you want to look at uh, where the birds are right now, you can log on, log on to this website, trumpeters, trumpeterswan.com. Netlify, N-E-T-L-I-F-Y dot A-P-P -P slash. And you can go and you can see maps of where these birds currently are. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, we see that uh, we had basically this past year, uh, birds collected, we had three, three cygnets collected at a lake near Montello. And then up at the Northwest corner, there was a cygnet uh, and uh, adult uh, that were also tagged. And uh, those birds in the central part of the state have gone all the way down southwestern Illinois. And uh, what we found so far, this study, by the way, is, is being coordinated by, by uh, David Wolfson from University of Minnesota. And uh, what we found is that uh, some of the, the, the big movements, the large movements have been, been preceded by some major weather events, but quite a bit of variability in movements. The higher latitude birds 
have moved farther south than the, than the more southern birds. And northern birds have wintered in rivers and lakes with open water. So there's still much, much to learn, much data to gather. So we're in the, uh, the, the final year of this project. So we, had, we stopped in 2014 uh, doing the ground counts because we had so many swan nests out there, uh, the population continuing, really continuing to increase quite dramatically. We shifted to a, uh, a method of transects uh, to count the number of basically uh, white swans, so both adults and subadults. And this corresponded with North American Trumper Swan Survey across, across North America, coordinated by the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, we were using basically the same methods that have been used uh, for the, uh, the spring waterfowl survey here in Wisconsin. So there were already 60 randomly selected transects we added on 66, we added on 30 more for a total of 96 transects, each 30 miles long by a quarter mile wide. And uh, we used the expansion of the swan aerial density to estimate a, uh, for each of these, each of four regions in Wisconsin to estimate the breeding population. And here's Taylor Finger, who is a waterfowl biologist, Bureau of Wildlife Management smiling gleefully at all of the trumpeter swan nests that he's seeing. So in the, lower, in the upper left-hand corner here is the map with the, the bars that indicate the transects that we were running east to west. And you can see the rest of the slide, you can see the picture that the pilot sees. Now, how difficult are swans to see? They're quite easy to make out, large white birds. And you can see even in this slide, you can count the number of eggs in the nest. Um, so in 2015, the BPOP or, or breeding population was, was estimated to be 4695, 4695. In 2019, the last time the survey was run, uh, there was no survey last year because of COVID. We were at about 6,000 birds. So quite a, uh, quite a jump from our goal of 20. Well, what have we learned from this project? Well, it's been very important to have clear, obtainable research and management objectives. Identify early on your funding strategy and take advantage of opportunities as they arise. For example, in those early years, we, we partnered with the Milwaukee Ballet Company when they performed Swan Lake. We were able to make a pitch to the public at intermission about the Trumper Swan program. And we're able to obtain some, some funds uh, through that event. And then remain open to new and different approaches. Uh, we started out, I should say, I didn't, and I didn't mention this at the beginning, we started out with cross fostering in 1987, cross fostering trumper swan eggs under mute swans. We had 35 uh, eggs that we used for that in those very, very early years. Only one signet was able to reach fl fledging stage due to snapping turtle predation. So at that point in 1988 is when we, when Stan Temple and Mike Mossman and Becky Abel put their heads together and came up with decoy rearing. And then also we have partnered with uh, the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa Tribe and released uh, birds up there as well. And then build upon our partnerships. We've, we've had uh, over 700 different partners, and then learning to celebrate success with them, as well as learning from any kind of disappointments or failures that, that we uh, experienced along the way. But above all, to persist your goal. And this is, this is really true uh, in life of, of anything. You know, persist and visualize reaching your goal. 
regardless of what the objective is. So these are some of the major Trump response programs, uh, program partners. Um, through the DNR, the Bureau of Science Services, Wildlife Management, Endangered Resources, uh, Minnesota DNR, Michigan DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Trump Response Society, the Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin, very, very important in, in helping us to raise funds. They, they played an, an absolutely essential critical role to, uh, to funding our efforts. The Milwaukee County Zoo could not have happened without their involvement, the Zoological Society of Milwaukee County and the the Prairie Chicken Society uh, were all helpful in raising funds for us. Interns came from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, that time called the Department of Wildlife Ecology. General Electric Medical Systems, as I mentioned, near Pewaukee, very instrumental in, in, in wintering those uh, captive reared swans. Uh, Woodway Capital Corporation, the Kohlers, ICF, well, their interns helped many interns over many years, several years, help with the signet roundups. And of course, I mentioned for the, rab, the, the Bad River Band, Lake Superior Chippewa. So I just wanted to show this slide, um, which 82K, which has the record, the national record, according to the the talks at the Breeding Bird Laboratory. This is the, the oldest collared swan at that time uh, in 2015, 26 years old. Um, this, was a, this was a bird that uh, I collected as U2 in 1989. And I should mention that at that, where this mast occurred, this was getting close to hour number 12 of my 13 hour collection. So I was very tired <laughs> that day, that, uh, that particular trip, the end of that particular trip. And uh, in this case, the cob or male was extremely aggressive and uh, came close to uh, charging me a few times. But one thing that it did do is that it, in, it clipped it attacked the rear of the plane, clipped the communication wire so that we were not able to communicate with uh, the, the airport. Rod King then had to go to a cabin, remote site, and uh, dig up a, a ham radio and contact his wife and let them let her know our, of our estimated arrival at the airport. She needed to relay that information to the airport. So I was very, very pleased that you two <laughs> from that nest is the bird that made the record of the oldest collared trumper swan in North America. Uh, again, 2015, now has that bird survived? We have not seen that bird uh, since, since 2016. So it could be that that bird is no longer alive, but I thought I would show this this slide and tell that story. So finally, this is uh, my final slide taken this, this past January uh, here on Lake Monona, taken on Lake uh, Monona. This is a pair that had been wintering over on, uh, off and on at least throughout part of the winter at the Tenny Locks on Lake Mendota. This was taken in the early morning a uh, beautiful shot and uh, it's I think a very fitting way to end this presentation. I'll just simply say that this, this project would not have been successful without the significant contributions of many different partners. Uh, no one single, single individual is responsible for the success of this program. It really took a unique partnership between the public and private sector to make it successful. Well, thank you very much. I appreciated talking to you. Are there any questions? Let me know. Hey, Sumner, thanks. That was, uh, that was great. What a neat and successful uh, recovery story. And um, we do have, let's see, we do have at least one question here for you. Uh, 
so someone says they have a group of trumpeter swans overwintering uh, in Eau Claire over in Bayfield County. And they ask, do families remain together? Or maybe how long do families remain together? Yes, they do remain together. Um, but they remain together that certainly that, that first year. Now, when they reach age two, they tend to kick, kick away, so to speak, the, the cygnets because it's a new nesting season. Um, and though the, uh, the, 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 uh, the two-year-old birds then have to go off and fend for themselves, basically. Um, so the parents are basically done with them at that, about that age. Uh, so at that point, we see that even two-year-olds, and actually until this work occurred, not only in Minnesota, which has another uh, very vibrant program, they have probably the largest number of, of swans in, in uh, what's called the interior population. And one thing I should have mentioned is that there are three, for management purposes, there are three different populations. There's the Rocky Mountain population, there's the Pacific Coast population, in the interior population of which we are a part. Interior population is comprised of restoration flocks. Minnesota now has about 17,000. You know, I mentioned that we have about probably by now, probably close to 7,000, but 6,000 when we last did a count. Uh, they have 17,000. The, the interior population now numbers 27,000. It's now the largest of the three populations and it's made of these restoration flocks. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, it's amazing how well they've they've done over the last couple of decades. Yeah, I mean, if anybody wants to know in terms of how the other populations are doing, the Rocky Mountain population has not met their population objectives. They are, are at last count, at least twenty in twenty fifteen. So this may be old information, depending on when the next uh, survey occurs of that of that population. They are at about uh, eleven thousand. 721, and the uh, Pacific Coast population has a pop had a population in 2015 of about 24,000. So 24,000, 11, 7, 11.7, .7, and 27,000. Altogether, about 63,000 trumpeter swans breeding uh, in North America. 60, I should say, 63,000 swans, trumpeter swans. Uh, in North America. That includes both subadults and adults, so breeders and non-breeders. One thing that we were able to prove through our restoration efforts is that it was, it was believed that up until we began our restoration effort, the trumpeter swans didn't begin, nest, didn't begin nesting until they were three or four years of age. And that was because a lot of the studies occurred in saturated habitats. Well, what we found out through our program specifically is that two-year-old birds, these decoy birds that reached two years of age, they started breeding uh, at habitat that was widely available for trumpeter swans. Uh, and it just showed that if the birds have the habitat, if they're not, uh, uh, if they're not restricted, they can nest as early as two years. And so we kind of, turn things a little bit on its head by discovering that birds can nest that early. They didn't have to wait until they were three or four years of age. And that has also contributed to the, to really to the uh, tremendous growth that we've seen of, Trump, of the Trump or Swan population in Wisconsin. We've got, uh, we've got a few more questions here, uh, maybe related to where we can find trumpeter swans in Wisconsin. Um, so someone makes a comment. Uh, that perhaps folks would be interested to know uh, that they might be found in corn stubble in the spring, not where you would maybe expect to see them. Uh, and then someone else asks where you can find trumpeter swans uh, over at Crex Meadows. And if you can find them there, when is the best time of year and day to see them? Yeah, Crex Meadows would be a great time. I should mention that uh, the Natural Resources Foundation has had field trips uh, up to Crex Meadows. So you might check with them to see if they have a, a field trip planned this year. Natural Resources Foundation, you can just Google them and you can, you can uh, connect with them that way. Um, 
The best time to see them, I would say, would be in August, uh, late July, August, and September, when they have their family groups. They are very visible. They are out in the marshes. Uh, the density is quite high up there. So if you call ahead to the office, they can tell you exactly where to go that year to see them. But July, late July and into August, uh, throughout August into September, that's the best place to go. And it's well worth it. Yeah, uh, let's see, we've got a few more here. What is the cost of a year's worth of work to monitor the swans on average? Well, uh, it's changed because we no longer do the nest counts. Uh, monitoring is, is now occurring by air through these aerial transects. And uh, I don't have the latest figures on that. We haven't done this. We didn't do this last year. So current uh, dollars, it's probably around uh, 5,000 or so, but I could, whoever wants to get, uh, get a hold of me uh, at uh, sumner.madison at wisconsin.gov, I can get you some exact figures. All right. And then we've got, uh, let's see, we've got a few more here. Is there any documentation of birds and the various populations dispersing to any of the other populations? Uh, that's a that's a good question. So yes, we've had uh, well in terms of I'm not sure if that person means to each, each of the managed populations like Pacific, if that's if, or if they mean in terms of uh, between states. I'm not sure what exactly what that means, but I can say that we have had some birds from Wisconsin go into Minnesota and nest there, uh, and vice versa. We've had Minnesota birds nesting in Wisconsin. Um, we, we do have birds that co-mingled during the winter time. Uh, we've had birds uh, going to the Southwest, also as, as far East as the uh, uh, Chesapeake Bay in the winter time, uh, not many. Um, most of them head to the, uh, the Southern part of the, uh, of the country, Southern part of the Mississippi Flyway, um, down to uh, Missouri, Southwest Illinois, Indiana, so forth. But um, uh, we do not have, for the most part, we do not have larger groups. We do not have the Pacific Coast birds. We do not, we do not see you know, Rocky Mountain birds over in, uh, in the interior population for the most part. There might be some birds over in Western Minnesota that come from the Rocky Mountain population, but I'm not sure about that. But as far as Wisconsin, we see mainly just the interior population birds here. All right, and we'll wrap it up. We've got one more. Are they aggressive to loons? That's a very good question. Uh, I would say overall, generally, they are not aggressive to loons. They are more aggressive to to uh, to Canada geese. Um, if there's a loon that, depending on the on the breeding phenology, if there are if there is a loon that is you know, very close to a nest, perhaps they may be, but you know, loons are divers. So they often escape. So there's not really any kind of issue between trumpeters and loons. Uh, trumpeters uh, will go after, really will go after Canada geese that uh, occupy their territory. And I should say the territory of a trumpeter swan ranges from six to about 150 acres in size. All right. I think we'll I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thanks so much, Sumner. That was a, a wonderful presentation, and again, just a really neat uh, recovery story of trumpeter swans here in Wisconsin. My so, pleasure. Thank you. If anybody has any more questions, just reach me through my email, Sumner Madison Wisconsin spelled out dot g o v gov. Thank you again. Well, all right. Um, thank you. And we'll take a 10 minute break and then we're going to uh, reconvene for the plenary session from 11 to noon. And then we'll be back in this uh, session on climate and charismatic water birds. Let's see at uh, at 12 o'clock to hear a talk from uh, Taylor Finger on variation in water and climate in Wisconsin waterfowl. All right. Thank you, and we'll uh, we'll see you back at noon. Bye. Bye bye.
Thanks, Sumner. That was great. Oh, you bet. You think people? Yeah. Know that? I learned a lot. <laughs> 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 so, uh, but I'm assuming people probably did. It's really interesting to hear. Oh, good. Yeah. That's yeah, there was a, a lot of uh, good comments. You know, I think people really appreciated it in the in the question and answer session. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. uh it's been quite a uh, quite a story. Um, just the way it's grown and the way the population has grown and the number of people that have been involved and there isn't a there isn't a day.